All right, we're going to get uh, going here. Uh, so um, what we're going to do today is talk in more detail about the three domains of life and the tree of life. As our usual reminder here, in the previous lecture we talked about uh, in part about the tree of life, we're going to finish that up and talk a little bit about the three main lineages of life, also called the three domains. And then in the next lecture, we're going to talk about um, two of these three domains in particular, the bacteria and the archaea and some of their diversity. But first, we are going to do our exciting quiz. Um, so you need to get out the clickers. Um, and the way it's going to work is we have four questions. We're going to give you about. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it's a little off. Uh, so we're going to have um, time work, apparently. Um, we're going to have four questions. We're going to give you about a minute to a minute and a half for each question. Um, so we're going to do them as clicker questions. It's going to count as 10 points total. And uh, as I told you before, there are going to be six of these quizzes. You're going to be able to drop your worst score. So in total, the quizzes will add up to 50 possible points for everyone. So you know, if you get 10 out of 10 on the first five, you can throw things at us during the sixth one or, what, or whatever. So um, you can. Uh, Hopefully we will tell you as much as we can about what we expect you to do. And one of the main goals, as we've told you, is that there's reading material that's really, really helpful for some of the stuff we're talking about in lecture. And in theory, I know based upon other students and my own experience, you could just cram before the midterm. Um, but to follow along, there are many things that are going to be really helpful, and that's how I selected the reading for this particular quiz is basically background material for um, some of the stuff we're talking about in the in the lecture. So again, what we're going to do is go through each of the questions, um, give you a minute or a minute and a half for each of them. You are allowed one sheet of paper, one sheet of notes. If you made that, put away everything else. Put away your phones, your um, notes, your computers. Uh, everything else? And unlike the clicker questions in class, this is not a group exercise. So I'm going to start now, unless there are any questions about this. Yeah? When you have answered your question, flip you your clicker over, please. All right. Yeah? No, no, it'll, if, you, if you change it by the time it's done, it, it will record the new answer. Um, what? Just press it again and hit send. Uh, should be, it should show you a check again after you do that. All right, so I will read the questions. And then, um, so complete this sentence. The conclusion or conclusions from the work described in section 22.2 on testing phylogenetic methods was as follows. That it was possible to accurately reconstruct and then fill in the blank with A, B, C, or D. Another 10 seconds or so. Five seconds. 
right? So the second question is, what was being evolved in the experiments described in the section in chapter 22 on testing phylogenetic methods? And you have until a minute. Three seconds. All right. The origin of photosynthesis led directly or indirectly to many changes across the planet, including all of the following except, that is, all of those except one, and choose the one that is incorrect. Another 10 seconds. <laughs> All right, can I stop it? All right, then last and certainly the hardest. <laughs> Which of the following is not one of the domains of life? I'm not going to give you a minute. <laughs> Another five seconds. All right. I'm afraid we can't tell you the answers until the next class. Uh, but we're going to go on in the lecture now. You can take back out all of your supplies and devices and other things. All right. We can, we're going to get back into the lovely, exciting tree of life now. Um, and what, what we're going to spend a bunch of time for the next lecture and a half on largely relates to major features of organisms, major features of the different representatives of the three domains of life. We are going to assume that you know some of the char characteristic features of eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. The reading in chapter 26 and 27 assumes that you know many of those characteristic features. If you want to catch up, and if you're like me and you forget what you learned last quarter within five minutes after the end of that quarter, um, you might want to review these sections, 4.4, 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3. It's not a ton of material, but it really does capture a lot of the key features of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. And again, the reading in chapter 26 and 27 in many cases sort of assumes that you know a lot of these because it's going to talk about 
variants on some of these features as well as the evolution of some of these features. So again, 4.4, 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3. Okay, so what we're going to do is sort of wrap up the previous topic, which is just the general concept of the tree of life, and then talk about rooting that tree, and then talk about using the rooted tree of life to study the evolution of features of organisms. So I started in on this, but I'm going to back up a tiny bit and just go through uh, the last part again. The tree of life as we know it today was basically revolutionized by studies of this one person, Carl Woese. And as I mentioned, what he was doing was looking inside ribosomes. So here are these universal features, universal homologies that from the outside look basically identical among all organisms. And back in the 1970s when Carl Woese was doing this, what he was interested in was solving the riddle of the genetic code. There were many people that were trying to understand exactly how RNA was translated into proteins. But what he sort of happened upon was something very intriguing and interesting. So what he was doing was basically taking apart the ribosome, using various chemical methods to separate out the different components of the ribosome. And he was particularly interested in these components of this machine that are made up of RNA. So the ribosome is this cellular machine that carries out protein translation. And it's made up of a set of proteins, homo versions of those proteins, homologous versions of those proteins are found across all organisms on the planet. But in addition, the ribosome has these components that are made up of RNA. They're known as ribosomal RNA and they are never translated into protein. So you may think that, you know, a lot of the RNAs made in cells are translated into protein, but actually one of the, in terms of volume, the most amount of RNA made in a cell is usually corresponds to these ribosomal RNAs that get put into the ribosome and used in this process of translation. And Woese was interested in these components, and what he did was he separated them out chemically, and he had a chemical reaction that allowed him to read the letters that correspond to the RNA elements in the ribosome RNA. So you should understand that all RNAs and all proteins in a cell are encoded in the DNA in that cell. So somewhere in the genome of every organism on the planet is a gene that carries the instructions for making ribosomal RNA. That gene gets transcribed into RNA. So the DNA gets copied, in essence, into RNA. And that RNA has a string of letters, just like the DNA does. Now, RNA uses a slightly different sort of set of letters, A, C, U, and G instead of A, C, T, and G. But the concept is the same. It's a long string made up of chemical subunits, and the subunits come in different chemical forms, four forms, and they're abbreviated A, C, U, and G. And what Woese was doing was reading that string of letters in the ribosomal RNAs in different organisms. And what he realized when he was doing this was this now provided him with a way to use universal homologies, the presence of these ribosomes, to build a tree of life. Because the string of letters inside the ribosomal RNA differed between organisms. It made the same functional unit. It folded over into the same structure. But inside of it, the string of letters differed between taxa. And he could use that string of letters, each position, as a different character, and the base as a different character state, and compare the string of letters between different organisms, just like we did with our DNA matrix for the phylogenetic reconstruction that we did. And he could build a tree that for the first time included all organisms on the planet. Because the problem that people had faced previously was sort of a problem of scale. If you were interested in vertebrates, 
There were lots of features you could use to build an evolutionary tree of vertebrates. Bone structure, physiology, behavior, fossil record, lots of different things. The same was true for plants. But it was very hard for people to group animals, plants, and in particular microbes onto one tree. Because what they had in common with each other were these universal homologies. And all that they knew before Wos was reading the sequence of these ribosome RNAs was that the character state was present in everything. And that was not phylogenetically informative. So the phylogenetic trees that included microbes, the position of microbes in the tree was, for many, in, for, for many of them, in essence, made up. And what Wos did was actually build a tree from data. And this is an example of what the data would look like. You can take each row here is a, the ribosomal RNA for a different taxon. Each column is a different position or character in the ribosomal RNA. And you can't see it here, but inside each of these boxes is the character state for each taxon for each column. And in some cases, there's no variation, so all organisms have the same string of letters here, but then there's variation in this region. Same string of letters here, and then variation. There was enough variation between taxa to build a tree. This is conceptually analogous to taking bones from vertebrates, lining them up with each other. Those are the homologies across different vertebrates. Every vertebrate basically has a femur basically has a humerus, has different bones that you can line up. But the bones are different in terms of their size and their shape and some of their internal constructs. So the bones are the equivalent of the different parts of the ribosome. And the sequence is the equivalent of the size and shape and nature of each of the different bones. And now you can build a tree of life that includes everything. Like with bones, it can sometimes be hard to know uh, exactly what you're looking at for a particular part of the skeleton of an organism. So frequently, you would line things up. And so you can figure out that you're looking at you know, the radius and ulna if they're next to a humerus. Even if you weren't sure when you found the fossil somewhere that, you know, is this really a radius? If you were connected to something else that you could tell what it was, you use the vertebrate structure to line up which bones are which. You do the same thing with the ribosome. You use the structure of these ribosomal RNA molecules to tell you where you are to line things up between different organisms. So we're not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but I thought in the interest of full disclosure, I would tell you that Wos took that data and built an evolutionary tree. He used neither parsimony nor likelihood methods. He used a third class of evolutionary reconstruction method called distance methods. Distance methods work on a relatively simple principle. You take the data of organisms that you're interested in, you compare all taxa to each other, and you calculate a difference between them. In essence, you calculate one minus the percent similarity of organisms. The more different organisms are, the further apart they should be on the tree. The more similar organisms are, the closer they should be on the tree. Distance methods are very unusual compared to what we've been talking about because they involve a calculation of a tree. Rather than comparing different trees and giving them scores, most distance methods take data for organisms and directly calculate a tree with an algorithm. So we're not going to talk a lot about distance methods, but I thought it was important to tell you that there was this third class of methods that was used by Wos to build his tree. This is, in essence, what the tree looked like that he inferred. This is a slightly later version. He did one of these in 1977 and then added a few extra taxa to it, but this is basically what it looked like. 
And there are two incredibly important parts of this tree. The first is that it included all organisms, and the second is that the prokaryotes were split into these two separate, distinct evolutionary lineages. And so the important part here is that prior to him doing this analysis, in every tree that anyone drew that include, tried to include bacteria, all organisms without a nucleus, they were called prokaryotes, were lumped together into one group. They were lumped together based upon the absence of a feature. That is, they did not have a nucleus. And it turns out that there are two distinct groups hidden within that featureless group of organisms. When Woes first did this, he looked in these two groups, and in this one group here, it included most of the bacteria that people had heard of at the time. So the causative agents of many bacterial diseases like cholera and anthrax and tuberculosis and all the other causative agents of bacterial-borne diseases, as well as many sort of well-known model organisms like E. coli and things like that. And so he called them the true bacteria. E-U, U means true. Um, so these he called the true bacteria. And these he called the archae bacteria. The archae coming from the fact that many of these organisms in this group lived in environments that he thought resembled the early earth. Boiling hot springs, acid pools, salt evaporators, and other very extreme environments. Now it turns out this was a terrible choice of names. What he wanted to emphasize was that this group was as unique as any of the other groups, and he kept the bacteria part in their name, um, even though he was trying to argue that they weren't bacteria, in fact. So that's why they've been renamed the archaea, and that's the name that's used in the book. The bacteria part of the name has been deleted. These are now just called the bacteria, rather than the eubacteria, and these are called the eukarya, or sometimes the eukaryotes is still used. So those are the three main branches of organisms on the tree of life. And he was the first person to find these. So are there any questions about that before I move on into other details of the phylogeny? This was very revolutionarily, re revolutionary. Um, when he wrote a paper on this in 1977, it was reported on the front page of the New York Times. I mean, this was a big deal. This hidden lineage, third branch in the tree of life, changed how everybody thought about microbes. Yeah, is there a question? So when they first did this, did you use Yeah, so when he first did this, the chemical methods that you could read the letters in molecules inside cells were very challenging to use. And if you look inside of a cell um, and you count the number of molecules that correspond to a particular entity in the cell, that's really important because the chemical methods that he used needed a ton of maturity. So inside a cell, the most single most abundant RNA molecules in a cell are ribosomal RNAs. Cells need a lot of ribosomes to make proteins. So they are chock full of ribosomal RNAs. And each cell, like a bacteria, it has one copy of the gene, or two copies of the gene for ribosomal RNA. And it would have hundreds of thousands of copies of the ribosomal RNA molecule. And that allowed him to isolate, physically isolate the ribosomes, and read the string of letters in the RNA. Since you know, the RNA comes directly from the DNA, you can calculate what the DNA sequence is based upon the RNA sequence. that make sense? Yeah. Ha, <laughs> what a great question. He did not root the tree. Do you know why? Uh, he did not know the relationships among the three domains. Um, that is correct. How could he have figured out where to root the tree? How do we root the tree? Depending on what the outgroup is. Depending on what the outgroup is. What's the outgroup? for all organisms on the planet? Rocks. Rocks, right? So I'll get to this in a minute, but 
He drew an unrooted tree because, in fact, there was no way to root it back there. And I'll come back to the rooting in, in a couple of minutes. Um, but it's because there was no outrooting. Any other? Okay, so just before we get to the rooting, I just want to reemphasize you should go back and look at some of this material in Chapter 5. Eukaryotic cells, when you look at them in the microscope, even a light microscope, but certainly an electron microscope, they look incredibly complicated in most cases. They are chock full of all sorts of different membrane structures and cellular components and things called organelles, which are membrane-bound compartments inside cells. There are machines that carry out adding sugar groups onto different proteins. There are machines that degrade things from the outside. There are um, highways of traffic for moving different particles inside the cell. One of those cellular structures is the nucleus. That's sort of the hallmark feature of eukaryotic cells. But there are lots and lots of other things, lysosomes, Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria in many of them, chloroplasts in the photosynthetic ones, incredibly complicated subcellular structures. In contrast, if you look inside many, but not all, prokaryotic cells, they look very simple, even with high-resolution electron microscopes in many cases. They just don't look as complicated. And this is partly what led people to lump them all together. Ah, they're just not that interesting. Let's put them all into this little bin called prokaryotes. Um, just these are the pictures I meant to show a second ago. This is one of the environments where WOS, where some of the archaea bacteria, now called the archaea, came from. Uh, boiling hot spring in Yellowstone National Park, or these salt evaporators by the Dunbarton Bridge over in the Bay Area. Um, they lived in these really weird, extreme environments. Um, but it turns out that there are archaea in normal environments too. Um, and we'll get to that in the next couple of lectures. So one of the great things about this finding of a third branch in the tree of life is that when people went back and looked in detail at the biology of organisms, they discovered that, in fact, archaea had many features that appeared to be distinct from bacteria or eukaryotes. And bacteria had many features that appeared to be distinct from eukaryotes or archaea. And eukaryotes, again, had many features, although many people knew that already, that see, appeared to be distinct. There's a table in chapter 26 that you should look at and familiarize yourself with, which identifies many of these sort of hallmark similarities and differences between the three domains of life. We're going to talk about many of them, but not all of them. You should definitely... Uh, look in detail at this particular table, 26.1. One of them that we will talk about a little bit involves the lipids inside cells. So it turns out, I'm just going to skip this chemical structure for a second. Um, if you look at the lipids that surround all cells, lipids form this bilayer where you have these hydrophilic parts on the outside that sit in water and hydrophobic parts on the inside. Hydrophobic means they repel water. And that's how you get this cell membrane around a cell. The archaea, the membrane that surrounds archaea, is chemically unique and distinct from the membranes that surround bacteria and eukaryotes. The way it is distinct, you don't have to understand the exact chemistry of this, but the way it's distinct is the difference between these bonds here, ester linkages and ether linkages. And um, just so you know, on the slides that I've shared with you, for some reason the book made slides. The book, we get a bunch of these slides from the makers of the book. Um, it has an error here. It's supposed to say that archaea have the ether linked branched form. The textbook, your table is correct. But, the, but this figure, if you're studying off this, remember that it's got this error here. But archaea have this, again, you don't have to know the chemical details, but they have a different membrane chemistry than bacteria or eukaryotes. This is important for many reasons. One reason that it's important is if you want to find archaea in the environment, you can actually sniff around for these types of membranes rather than for any other feature of, of archaea. You can even find fossilized samples and test for which membranes are present in those fossils 
and tell whether or not archaea were in the sample. So this feature of archaea was completely unrecognized until Woe spilt that tree. Um, what I'm not going to talk about in detail today, but we will come back to in a later lecture, is viruses. So viruses are generally not talked about when we talk about the tree of life, because most scientists don't consider viruses to be alive. They are obligate parasites that depend upon other organisms for their existence and their reproduction, and are therefore not generally considered independent entities. Where exactly they, so, but they do evolve. They have genomes, either DNA or RNA genomes, and they do evolve. Where exactly they evolved from, where you would place them on a phylogenetic tree if you included non-living organisms like viruses, is a great debate, and we will talk about this in one lecture later on. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, this is a great question. Is it possible to put viruses as an outgroup? It is possible, but there's no obvious reason to do it that way. So there are many people in the last few years who have argued that viruses, some viruses represent the fourth domain. Um, it's not clear if that's true, first of all. And second of all, it's unclear which viruses you would use for that purpose. It's pretty clear that there are other viruses that evolved from transposable elements or from living modern organisms within one of the three branches. And if you picked one of those as your outgroup, you would get the wrong rooting of the tree. So it's very awkward right now to figure out uh, how to use viruses to infer the structure of the tree. However, there is unbelievable diversity in viruses. Diversity of form and function, and just they represent you know, the most abundant things on the planet, and they are very important ecologically and functionally to all ecosystems. We're not going to talk about them a lot in this class, but they are just phenomenally interesting and very poorly understood generally. Yeah. Yeah, so are there homologous features between viruses and the three domains of life? There are some viruses that have genes that are found across the domains of life. Unfortunately, right now, no viruses have ribosomal RNA genes, for example, but some of them have things like elongation factors and ribosomal proteins and other genes that are found throughout the other organisms on the planet. But many viruses have nothing. There are quite a few viruses that all of their genes have no detectable homology to anything present in any of the cellular organisms. So those viruses, we have no idea what to do with in those cases. And then there are other viruses that have sort of a component that might be found in, say, yeast, but not in anything else. And there are viruses that have sort of components that are found in humans, but not in anything else. So there's enormous diversity, and there are very few that have these sort of Deeply conserved. Yeah. Would it, sorry, can you repeat that? Well, you're saying that there's an outlier, right? Yeah, viruses are almost certainly not a monocolor. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, so uh, there are three main theories about viruses. The, the first is that they evolved from a parasitic bacteria or other like parasitic eukaryotes and threw away their cell membrane and kept a little protein coat to protect them. So there are many bacteria that are very simple and small, and you can imagine that they could have thrown away a little bit more of their cellular machinery and become a virus. A second theory is that some viruses evolve from what are called transposable elements. These are pieces of DNA that move around inside the genome of an organism. And they actually encode sometimes the exact same genes found in viruses to do that movement. They just don't have a protein shaft. And then there's a third theory, which gets back to one of the previous questions, which is that viruses are the fourth branch on the tree of life, that they predate the existence of the most recent common ancestor. I think all three of those are, in fact, correct. And that viruses are not a monophyletic group. They have multiple distinct origins, and we need to sort of sort them out more carefully before 
figuring out what each one of them means for the tree. And we'll talk a little bit more about viruses when we talk about human associated microbes, because those are generally the best studied viruses. Um, so now this uh, gets back to the question raised before. This is uh, ignore the fact that I act, unfortunately drew something called a root on this tree. Um, that's based upon other information. So this is a more detailed version of the Woese tree. Many people have gone and surveyed all sorts of different kinds of organisms, looking at not just ribosomal RNA genes now, but all sorts of other genes. And in general, the same structure of the tree has been found in most of these studies. That is, it still appears that there are three major branches to the tree, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, or eukaryotes. One very important thing is that the vast majority of the lineages on the planet, the vast majority of the actual phylogenetic diversity of life, the part that I've blotted out in gray here, is microbial. So the multicellular organisms are pretty much here, the fungi, the land plants, and the animals. There are occasionally, as we will talk about later, a few multicellular other organisms. But most of the organisms on the planet, most of the diversity spends its life predominantly as a single cell. And that's what we're going to talk about for the next week and a half is the rest of this diversity before we get into fungi and plants and animals. So in the book, and in basically the rest of the class, we are going to use this rooted tree of life. This rooted tree shows eukaryotes and archaea as sister taxa, and bacteria as the deepest branch in the tree. This did not come from Woese's work. Because Woese did not have an outgroup, he was unable to root his tree. So again, this tree, if you ignore this branch here, um, is an, un, an expanded version of the unrooted tree of Woes. So what I want to talk about for a little bit is, just for about 10 minutes, is rooting this tree. And what it looks like to root the tree in different ways. And then very briefly tell you about how this tree was in fact rooted to come up with the rooted tree that we're using in the book and in the rest of the class. So remember, when we were building phylogenetic trees for these four taxa, we did unrooted phylogenetic trees, just like Woese did. And the only way we got around the unrootedness of those trees was we could look at the taxa that we were studying and flag one of them as an outgroup, and then draw the root branch into the branch that connected the outgroup to the rest of the tree. And then we untangle the rooted, the unrooted tree to draw a rooted version of it, rooted with the outgroup as the deepest branch in the tree. Now we can't do that because the tree of life includes all taxa, and there is no obvious outgroup among those taxa to choose and use to root the tree. I'm just going to throw away the complexity here and go to the simplest version of this unrooted tree, which looks like this. Just three major branches. So if we wanted to root this tree, how many different ways can we root it? Three, right? So we can draw a root branch going into here, here, or here. If we draw it into here, the archaea are the deepest branch. And then we would have a branch with eukarya and bacteria as sister taxa. If we draw it into here, eukarya are the deepest branch. And if we draw it into here, bacteria are the deepest branch. So these rooted trees look like this. Archaea is the deepest branch. Eukarya is the deepest branch. Or bacteria as the deepest branch. And because it takes about two lectures to go into all the details, we're not going to talk about the exact details of why this tree has been chosen to represent the rooted tree of life, but I'm going to explain it to you in the next few minutes. And I'd be happy to talk to anybody who's interested in this afterwards. So 
The concept you should understand. What you are doing when you look for an outgroup to a particular group of taxa is really what you're looking for is some event that happened on the branch leading up to the common ancestor of all the organisms that you care about. What we've been focusing on is a branching event where another lineage comes off and represents our outgroup. Since our tree is showing all modern organisms on the planet, we have no other organism that can represent an outgroup. We could possibly look through the fossil record to find things that might represent a fourth branch on the tree. No such thing has ever been found, so we can't use it as of yet. But in theory, you might find some organism sometime in the past that you could say represents an outgroup and you could use it as your you know, outgroup to root the tree if you had the right data from that organism. But that doesn't exist. So what um, a few scientists figured out in the late 1980s was a really completely brilliant trick to figuring out how to root the tree of life. And what they did was they basically said, what type of events can we study that happened back here on the branch leading to the common ancestor of everything? And what they figured out was that this organism back here, the most recent common ancestor of everything. Now, they didn't know the order of branching, so they basically considered any of these three possibilities. But all of those three possibilities trace back to a most recent common ancestor. And they said, um, maybe there are evolutionary events that occurred prior to the existence of that common ancestor. And the events that they focused on were what are called gene duplication events. So it turns out inside the genome of any organism, just like you can have a mutation from C to T, or from G to A, you can have the region, a region of the genome that makes a copy of itself. It's called a duplication event. Duplication events are frequently followed by divergence of the duplicates from each other. So this is what's thought to have happened in the history of globin genes. The genes that make up that code for the proteins that make up all of our different hemoglobins. So you may or may not remember this, but the hemoglobin circulating in your blood is made up of two primary different types of globin proteins, alpha globin and beta globin. And there's also myoglobin in your muscles and a variety of other globins that are involved in things like fetal circulation and the fetus pulling blood from the mother and so on. All of those are coded for by individual genes. And each of those genes is related to the other genes. They came from an ancestral single globin gene that some ancestor of vertebrates had. It was made into multiple copies, and one of them became beta globin, one of them became alpha globin, one of them became myoglobin. It turns out if you wanted to build an evolutionary tree of mammals, you could build a tree of alpha globins, and if you included one beta globin in your tree, the beta globin serves as an outgroup to all the other globins. It separated in evolutionary history prior to the common ancestor of all of the alpha globins. People knew this in the 1980s. And these scientists said, well, maybe there were duplication events that happened prior to the existence of the common ancestor of everything. Globin-like things. And it turns out there are many. So in the apparatus that translates proteins, translates RNA into proteins, there are proteins called elongation factors. Every organism on the planet has two versions of elongation factors. Elongation factor G and elongation factor 2, TU. All elongation factor Gs share a common ancestry with each other. All elongation factor 2s share a common ancestry with each other. And both of them were present in the common ancestor of everything. In addition, they are related to each other by one of these duplication events that happened prior to the existence of the common ancestor of everything. So what these scientists figured out was you could build a tree like this with elongation factor G. 
And you could make it into a tree like this by including elongation factor 2 in the same tree. They're related to each other. And all the elongation factor g's show up in one part of the tree. And you can root the tree using elongation factor 2 as your outgroup compared to elongation factor g. Now this might take a little bit to wrap your heads around and it's why we're not covering it because to draw this all out requires about two days worth of lecturing. But it is a completely brilliant evolutionary insight that allowed people to root the tree of life. And what was amazing when they wrote these papers was that they took elongation factor g and built a tree of it and then rooted it to elongation factor 2. And the tree looked like this. Archaea and eukaryotes together and bacteria as the deepest branch. They did the same with the other elongation factor and it had this exact tree. They did the same thing with an ATPase, an enzyme that cuts ATP in half. They got this tree. So every time they looked at one of these duplicated genes, it pointed to the tree looking like this, which was very stunning to people. People did not expect that archaea would be a sister group to bacteria. Just because archaea look like bacteria, they expected bacteria and archaea to be sister taxa relative to each other. But that is not, in fact, what the tree looks like. So the tree, the best model for the tree of life looks like this. We will talk about some complexities in this model. Wait, just wait one minute. I'm going to cover one more thing before you go. We're going to talk about some complexities in this model in subsequent lectures. But for the time being, we're going to assume now that this rooted tree of life is correct. And what we're going to do is walk our way through many of the features of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. We're going to trace their evolutionary history on this tree. I will come back to all of this. And we're going to use that to understand the features of these different organisms. All right, see you Wednesday.